So I am uh, this is uh, Unitarians are in a difficult but interesting position regarding Easter. Uh, how many of you grew up in in some uh, branch of the Christian family of churches? Okay, so we've been there, we've done that, and for for many of us that's perfectly satisfactory. I always had difficulty with Easter. And as a kid, um, the youth minister made a big mistake and offered, asked me to prepare some remarks on the meaning of Easter as part of our coming of age. And I was under the influence of the Gospel of Mark at the time. It happened to be Mark Twain <laughs> and the letters from the earth. And so I, I created what seemed to me a plausible satire, imagining that I was an anthropologist from another planet that was observing these strange customs. And that was my first, the first time that a minister informed me with, with such gentleness and kindness that that was not really what he had hoped for. <laughs> Perhaps I could go back to the other Gospel of Mark and try again. So I haven't given up. That was about 1966. So here I am, 56 years later, or is it 66? No, 56. I'm still working on this. And um, what I'm going to do today is a kind of a a pretty typical Unitarian Universalist approach, and I'm focusing on Easter. I would take the same approach as if I was talking about Buddha's birthday, which is next Friday, the 8th, or Buddha's awakening, which is December 8th. And then as we take the, the contributions of the historic founder, but we lift them out of the past tense and bring them into the present tense. And instead of focusing on it as a once, one time only event that is definitive for Christians, just as Buddha's awakening is definitive for Buddhists, I look at, at it as an ever present possibility. And instead of making Easter a noun, I'm choosing to turn it into what I think is a gerund <laughs> of Eastering, a process, not a thing. And of course, this is, is a heresy. Uh, it was one of the defining heresies of the early Christian church. And um, what I want to remind you of is that the, the Greek word from which we create heresy is heresis, which means what we choose, how we choose. So this is a matter of choice. And if my choice is different than yours, um, Let's live with the beautiful harmonies of different notes. The only way we get harmony is if, and I was trying a little harmony on Thomas's song. I can do thirds. <laughs> I can do kind of dumb thirds. But it's the difference between the notes that creates the harmony. The other thing uh, I want to say by way of warning is there's some uh, what used to be referred to as Ted's interminable pauses. And when one of those irritating pauses Occurs, and it will occur about four or five times at the end of a section. Usually it's preceded by a question, and in that pause, I invite you to turn your attention inward so that your own version of the sermon can emerge. And maybe we can talk about the larger sermons uh, at the end of the hour. So it's clear that something is in the air. And if you live anywhere near a migratory flyway, there are daily messengers that something important that we call spring is happening. Uh, <coughs> seagulls are moving up and down the Mississippi flyway. Uh, pelicans, swans, if you know where to catch them. And this morning in Frontenac, the turkeys were out strutting. And if you've ever seen a turkey strut, now they bow, every time they take a, take a step, they bow their head. So they were uh, processing and bowing like a bunch of bishops. So spring is in the air. And that thankfully ever returning spring is, I think, the ground on which all of these holidays are built. Uh, Passover, the Jewish tradition, is on Friday, April 15th. Um, Easter, in the Christian tradition, now stretches with Thomas's help about six days. 
starting on, on Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Underground Saturday, Easter Sunday, Bright Monday, and who knows what Tuesday is. I guess it's Mardi Gras. Uh, and then Earth Day is coming, April 22nd. And in the uh, Islamic tradition, the way they celebrate spring is the whole month of April is Ramadan. They know how to throw a party. And all of these holidays, I'm convinced, are circling around some common themes. Out of darkness comes new life. Out of the terrible, cold, blight of nearly eternal winter comes this wonderful, mobile epiphany we call spring. And now is the time, and this is the place, to begin celebrating. So I'm going to lead, uh, throw out about five points that I think have to do with this process of Eastering, which I think is available to all of us not just in April, but in every moment. Uh, Easter is a way of honoring our ancestors and our mentors. I hope that all of us in this room uh, have had the opportunity to say goodbye to a beloved ancestor, uh, a beloved mentor. And, you know, good mentors use words, but they teach much more. And they, they shape our lives. We may not always like where the hammer meets the anvil, and I'm thinking of Robert Bly, who was really good with a hammer. But what a durable impact they have. And as I think over the past year, it seems to me that we've had to say goodbye to an awful lot of good people. And uh, when I look at those of us who are left here, I'm not quite sure we're going to fill those big shoes. And so uh, my guess is all of us have lost a friend, a mentor, an ancestor. And in a congregation like this, we need someone to step into the shoes of the, the relentless befrienders who meet people at the door, who grab their hand, who point them towards the bathroom, give them a cup of coffee, and help them find a place in this beloved community. So who are the people that come to your heart and mind, who have brought light and fun and love to your circle of family and friends, so that all of us might move forward into a gentler and kinder life. And this is a Mr. Rogers meditation. Who are the people living in death who loved you into being the person that you are? And this, I'm going to just signal the beginning of the pause. So honoring, thanking, saying goodbye is one place, one way that the process of Easter can begin. Easter can also be uh, a cultural transformation, and by transformation I mean two things. One, a fundamental change, but also in transit, because one of the ways that we move towards significant change is when we are in trance. And let's face it, there's a lot of uh, ideas in this culture, uh, in any culture, that could be recycled. I'm thinking, for example, of our persistent enthusiasm for tribalism. How is it that we get so invested in the differences between us and our neighbors? We do this in politics. We do this in religion, we do this in war, 
And in this country, it's reinforced several times a week by the rituals of sports. I wonder how long our addiction to fossil fuels will last. And if you've grown up in a family that has a, a, an itch they cannot scratch, an addiction, you know the harm that that can bring. Think of a whole country that can't get enough fossil fuel and keeps inventing new gizmos. Most of the people in our neighborhood are, uh, have at least 30 cylinders. Most of the guys have at least 30 cylinders to their name by the time you're done counting everything. What are the communal habits that might be buried in the good earth so that the gardens of life more abundant might spring forth. So let's pause and ponder that together. Eastering is about cultural transformation. It's also about personal transformation. It touches and can transform the habits of heart, mind, and action that perpetuate unhappiness, that perpetuate suffering in ourselves, our families, our kin, and our neighborhoods. And when we notice these habits that chain us uh, to the wheel of suffering, it doesn't make us comfortable. And without a little bit of strategic discomfort, we may never wake up. <coughs> Few would accuse Jesus or Buddha or Dr. King of trying to make their listeners more comfortable. They aim a little bit deeper than comfort. They aimed at liberation as if we were capable of that. And when we, we begin to look for our own habits of heart, it's, it's rarely a happy journey. I think, for example, when I look at my communications with family and friends and neighbors, how I'm still competing for some kind of prize. I'm still taking little digs at their big crook and observing, well, at least he'll look good in orange. Is it really necessary to keep trying to win the argument? after 50 years? What if I spent more time listening and less time haggling? And of course, I'm going to turn the question back to you. What are the habits of heart, mind, and embodied action within you that cause you to suffer or that cause others near to you to suffer? What are you willing to leave behind? Or bury in the good earth so that something new and gentler and kinder might blossom as surely as April showers bring May flowers. Easter isn't easy. Easter sometimes requires a little bit of sacrifice. And if you think about that word, it means what makes life sacred. The story of the Passover feast on Thursday leads inevitably to the prolonged embodied agony of Good Friday. There may be 
suffering that is unavoidable, something that needs to happen in service of a higher ideal. Jesus, Jesus wasn't just being dramatic when he said yes to Mission Impossible. Maybe he believed. Maybe someone told him if he offered himself as a perfect sacrifice, as a pastoral lamb, he might, he might be able to take away the sins of his tribe. Sometimes the road of life makes difficult, if not impossible, demands upon us. Sometimes we may need to undergo a challenging surgery in order to experience life more abundant. We may need to share resources so that a community that is not ours can thrive. We may need to help someone feed themselves today to increase the odds that when we need that, someone will be there to help us feed ourselves. So what are the sacrifices you are willing and not willing to make to ensure that people you know and people you do not know can live freely, drink clean water, breathe clean air? Who are the people in your networks who might benefit from a little extra loving attention. And Easter is death that leads to new life. Not every story, Easter story has a happy ending. And if you check the other Gospel of Mark, there's no Easter story at all. It ends with the phrase, and the God and the disciples were terrified and amazed. Now that is the ring of truth about it. So too in our lives, sometimes the presence of death leads to some very strange and tender chapters in our stories. Death often intensifies the presence of someone who is no longer with us in a body. We feel with increased intensity their remembered presence, but where are they? Where do they abide when they're done with their bodies? I feel their presence in my heart. I hear their footsteps echoing in the places and activities we share, but where are they now? Sometimes night dreams or daydreams can provide a safe place so we can carry forward an unfinished conversation. Heaven might begin in such a place where heart and mind continue the process of healing so the human soul can continue its journey after the body is dropped. And there's a very quirky little film on Netflix called The Discovery that uh, explores in a very interesting way healing in the body and healing after we're done with the body. How different is our own grieving from the experience of the heartbroken followers of Jesus who were visited by his bright image after his body was dead and buried? How much of what we call the Easter story is the disciples trying to come to terms with the heartbreaking loss of their beloved teacher? With whom? might you need to have a continuing conversation? With whom do you need to make peace or make amends or 
just continue the conversation. As we claim a place at the table of Easter, let us notice how each of the corners make a contribution. Remembering and thanking our ancestors connects us to a larger community of life. Letting go of some personal and cultural habits, making sacrifices can open the gateway to new life. Facing the inconvenient but persistent reality of death and continuing these conversations with those we have loved and lost can open the gates of the imagination. As William Blake wrote, joy and woe are woven by a clothing for the soul to buy. I'm going to uh, close in two ways. The, the preacher part of me is going, going to tell you what I believe, and then I'm going to uh, try to redeem, redeem belief by a short poem. Uh, I believe in an earthy and embodied Easter, an ever-present and universal process available to all who are willing to do the work, to go down into the dark night of grief and sacrifice, to let go and wait, and to reach out to family and friends and neighbors and even strangers until the stone over our hearts is rolled away and the light of a fresh and living truth can shine once again into our hearts, minds, bodies, and our beloved communities. May these words, if true, abide with you now and in all the days So I've been preaching for 50 years, and I can't help but notice that very little of preaching abides. It's sort of embarrassing. Uh, so one of the reasons, one of the things I've done in the pandemic is to write a poem a day or five poems a week or whatever. And I limit myself to between 50 and 150 words. And it takes less than, it takes several hours to create, it takes less than five minutes to read. My guess is that more of that may remain than most of the preaching I've done, which is embarrassing, but it's true. So this is called vein of gold. A golden ball of light rolls over the limestone bluffs again, leaving a bright, rippling path on the big river. Songbirds and even crows raise up hymns of praise. And is it any wonder? Where would we be without this daily gift of light? The need to praise runs deep. And those who follow this vein of gold grow both roots and wings. So that's my Easter wish for you, roots and wings, death and rebirth, Easter by any other name. We still have a few minutes left, so I want to open the floor, uh, invite you to share anything that you want to share when you discover it in one of those interminable pauses, or if you have questions or comments, those are welcome too. And this is how we try to take sermon as monologue and transform it into a dialogue or a trial. This, of course, is the moment that preachers count the house. <laughs> <laughs> Comes with the territory. Yes? This actually isn't about the sermon, but I can kind of work it in. Oh, please do. <laughs> it's regarding what Thomas said about was it right Monday? Yeah. We had no school on that day when I was a kid. Oh, wonderful. But, but we did not 
not followed by Monday, we call it Easter Monday. Fabulous. So I went back to uh, the university at the age of 50, and in my math class, I asked the teacher, so do we have Monday off? <laughs> and, and he said, why? And I said, well, it's Easter Monday. And he said, is it very funny? He said, oh. <laughs> But he had never heard of it, nobody, huh, in my surrounding school. So I don't know. Easter, when I was a kid, even though my grandparents were ministers, in my family of origin, it was about Easter baskets. Yeah. Oh. The Easter story, it wasn't so much the religious aspect. Yeah. Oh. Can I ask what part of the country you were in when they celebrated Easter Monday? Oh, uh, Dodge County, Wisconsin. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, farming community. Oh. Well, we could be part, David. I wouldn't beat yourself up too much. I think change, transformation, growth is very difficult. Yeah. We are, by nature, status quo entity. Yeah. Moving from that is difficult. Yeah. We used to give our incoming freshmen majors a, a quiz, a multiple choice quiz on their very first day, huh. very first class, huh. and then we give them the same quiz four years later in their final semester, huh. and the amount of change that we saw was very disheartening. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Pre and post testing, what a great idea. Yes, in the back. Is it okay if Noel says a song today? Sure. Sure. You just memorize it, Jeff. Okay. Because it's poetry month. Yeah. Come on up. You can take your mask off. You can take your mask off and, and let her rip. Yeah, use the mic. That's what it's here for. Roads diverged from the yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both. For being one traveler, long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the other boat. Then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as for that passing there had worn them really about the same. I woke that morning equally late, and these no step had trodden flat. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be tell telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and I was made all the difference. <laughs> So when you write letters and you know that they won't be responded to because he just doesn't uh, uh, incapable of being a good letter writer anyway. But that's part of the grieving process too before yeah. the person dies. Exactly. Yeah, 
preemptive grief. And you know, there's a way, as terrible as uh, Alzheimer's and dementia are, my mother had brain cancer, so there was a similar process. It's a long goodbye. And when there's a long goodbye for those who will eventually be left behind, it gives us more time to adjust. And when someone dies suddenly, you know, we, our body, our psyche goes into this attempt to reconstruct the relationship. So thank you for doing the good work of, of uh, preemptive grief. Uh, when my dad died very suddenly, what I did is I kept a journal for a year and I would write him a letter or two. And after a year or so of writing letters in the journal, that I could tell that that chapter was done. And then I spent the let me, I had a dream about him in which I opened a, if you spent time in a golf course in a locker room, there's lockers, you keep your stuff in there. And I opened a locker that was next to mine, and I saw a very nice pair of golf shoes. It was my dad's pair of golf shoes. And in the dream said, nice golf shoes, not mine. And I closed the door. And about a year later, I started a memorial golf tournament in my dad's memory, which has gone on now for almost 30 years. So we, we find ways to remember our ancestors and to keep celebrating. My mom's birthday is at the end of July. Most years in, uh, near the end of July, early part of August, we have a family reunion and we eat and talk for three or four days, which is celebrating her wonderful gifts of hospitality. So we find ways. We're, we're clever, clever to use imagination and embodied action to carry forward the best of what we received and then hopefully to let the stuff that is not the best and in one branch of my family Jack Daniels was referred to as Dr. Jack to let, let some of that go into the earth so it can't do as much harm. Kristen, you have a comment. Well, following on David's comments and one of the things I found really hard, and, um, and it came up for me in the sermon too, is whether to concentrate my energy and vision on what I need to change because it's bad, and what and, and the positive and some kind of positive framing of that. I really struggle with that because I naturally go to, you know, I'm bad. I need to change something, and, so, and I'm, I'm noticing it because it really got me. Right. Yeah. I want to go. So that's one of my struggles. Well, I think you're asking the right question. Whatever our native strategies are, the question I ask, does it help move us forward? If we go into shame and guilt and, and self flagellation mm -hmm. some people can der derive incredible spiritual energy from that. But for many of us, it just puts us further into the hole of depression, mm -hmm. makes us less capable of doing what we need to do. One of the great discoveries, I think, in the last 90, 80 years is the power of small groups who share a common affliction, uh, trauma, to work together towards constructive change. 12 steps, grief groups, you name it. It works, and with all due respect to my colleagues doing therapy, it's a lot cheaper than, than most therapy. So there are, so the, the important question is what empowers you to take the steps you need to? Well, that's what there are people, so that's really something. Yeah. yeah, and you know, Kristen is, is just a little bit more extroverted than I am. <laughs> <laughs> Being in a group is a natural. My idea of a good group is we have, for 26 years, we've hosted a monthly day of silent meditation. We have five to eight people in the house, but we're all silent most of the time. Fabulous. Fabulous. <laughs> but what's happened over the last several years, and Kristen has been one of the creative change agents, is we're talking more now. We talk at the beginning, we talk at lunch, we have a check in at the end, so now we're reaching a little more equilibrium. Other questions or comments or discoveries? We're almost out of time. So Easter is coming. Spring is arriving. Let's celebrate. Right? Thomas has got a new book coming out in about a month. I hope 
uh, well, if the book is out, maybe you can come and read from your yeah. book and sell a few copies. Mm -hmm. I'm good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll be coming back on May Day, oh. and I've asked uh, for help from Jens to find and if need be resurrect the maypole. Mm -hmm. So we'll do some cautious and age appropriate circling around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you laugh now, but 10 years from now we may do, be doing this in hopped up electric wheelchairs. Martha? <laughs>